Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the reading. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him and he saw God's Spirit descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my Son the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it is my honor to introduce our guest preacher for this weekend. I met Derek in February 2012 when he was the guest speaker at my high school youth group retreat. So we have been friends just shy of 11 years now. It's hard to believe. For more than the last decade, he has served as a campus minister and was the founding executive director of Campus to City Wesley Foundation, the United Methodist Campus Ministry serving students in Northeast Florida at the University of North Florida, Jacksonville University, and Flagler College. More recent endeavors include launching a a digital campus ministry platform called Studio Wesley to reach students and young adults who don't have an open and affirming campus ministry near them. Alongside his work to raise up a new generation of leaders and laborers who live as disciples of Jesus to transform the world, he serves as the co-lay leader of the Florida Conference to empower the lay people in the church. He is a leader in the continuing open and affirming United Methodist Church, and he, now, and he also knows how to pour beer. He has served as a beer tender at a local Jacksonville brewery for a number of years now. Church leader, lay leader, minister, beer tender. Also in his bio in the back, you will get some fun facts about him, including that he absolutely dislikes mayonnaise, of all things. I thought about surrounding the pulpit with mayonnaise just for fun, but decided against it. In all seriousness, God placed you in my life as I, as I was hearing the call to ministry 10 years ago. I didn't think I could do it but you spoke powerfully to me 
and pushed me into leadership opportunities. As in our baptism, we recognize the powerful grace of God. You took your baptismal vows seriously by helping to create a faithful disciple of Jesus who lives a more loving, liberating, and bold life because of your faithful witness. So thank you. People of God, please welcome Derek Scott. Well, good morning, friends. Awesome. Rushing, thank you. It is an honor to be here at your invitation. Um, just want you to know, uh, as he said, I'm a United Methodist campus minister and lay leader from the Florida Conference. And um, when folks found out that I was going to come up to Iowa to preach at Rushing's invitation, everybody was like, can we come too? Um, because they love this human so much and folks are so proud of the leader that he continues to be um, and grow into. And so I just want to cheer for you, my friend, and i and, um, just so excited for all that you're doing. I also have to just say, Plymouth Church, y'all are pretty awesome, okay? Um, this choir right behind me, y'all don't even understand what y'all did to my soul this morning, so thank you. So beautiful. Um, I'm honored to be in front of you this morning. Um, and as Rushing told you uh, a moment ago, um, <coughs> baptism uh, is, is a really important uh, sacrament in my world. It's something that I personally take seriously. Um, as much as I'd love to talk to you about United Methodism, I will not do that this morning. <laughs> but I will take you back to the church I grew up in. I actually grew up in a, a black Baptist church in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I, we were that ministry family. We were the family who was in church four days a week on an easy week. Um, and I actually was baptized at four years old. It, it was a beautiful sort of moment in my life that I actually do remember many aspects of uh, when I was baptized. And friends, I, I just I have to tell you that the day that I was baptized, I had this sense even at four, I know I couldn't have used the words that I'm about to use now as four, but I had this sense that I was being invited into a story. I had this sense that, that Jesus, by his love, was inviting me to be a part of something so much larger than myself. And so the text this morning that was read, Matthew 3, is really special to me. Now, that the first part of it, John the Baptist is doing his thing, screaming and stuff like that. It's awesome. You should go back and read it later. It, you'll get a lot out of it. it. It's really, really fun, okay? But I, it's the last few verses that I actually would love to sort of l uh, lean in on uh, because those last few verses were a part of the communion liturgy in the Black Baptist Church that I grew up in. We had communion every first Sunday, and every first Sunday, we would recite words that included Matthew, the end of, Matthew, the end of that Matthew 3 section. And so if you can imagine this, for the better part of 20 years, I was just saying these words every first Sunday. Now, in the church I grew up in, we use the King James Version. And friends, I just want you to know, I have issues with the King James Version, yes, and my theology's kind of moved on since then. But when you're six years old, sitting at church every first Sunday, preparing for communion, and you say these words, they get stuck in your brain. And the particular part that is stuck in there, even after all these years, it's the section where Jesus comes to his cousin John. He asks him to baptize him. And John essentially says to Jesus, Nah, bro. <laughs> that, that's Revised Standard Version. <laughs> Derek Revised Standard Version, by the way. Nah, bro, like, I need you to baptize me. And here's what Jesus says back to him in the King James Version. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it will fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Suffer it to be so now. Now, this is why I don't really like the King James Version of the Bible, because why would you put suffer there? Like, of all the words that you could put, suffer it to be so now. And the contemporary versions um, have changed it. The, the, the version that was read um, this morning was, let, it, let this be so, I believe is what it says. But that image got stuck in my brain, friends. Suffer it to be so now. And I got this sense 
reciting these words every first Sunday, year after year, that there was something costly happening in this story. It was almost as if Jesus was walking up to his cousin John, and he was saying, hey, John, I'm inviting you into this story. And yes, it, it will cost you, John. <laughs> you, you have been this firebrand of, of a leader on the edge of town, baptizing people, yelling at religious leaders. You think that John really has already has a role in the story, and he does. But I think in this moment where he is invited to play a different role, I mean, if he does this, he will be the one known for baptizing God incarnate. It was an invitation into a larger story. It was almost as if, I think, Jesus was saying, get off the sidelines. Yes, it'll cost. Suffer it to be so now. Again, that image, that image that to step into the story may cost, but it is the invitation that is actually available to each one of us. I think about how this weekend, in addition to being baptisms, uh, baptism of the Lord weekend, it is also um, the weekend that we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. and his work in this world. And I think about this preacher, this Southern black preacher, who could have easily sort of said, you know what, I have enough to do. <laughs> I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a theologian. I have members and people to tend to, funerals and weddings and pastoral care. You know, adding on being the center of the civil rights movement, that's just a lot. And no one would have blamed him in 1940s, 1950s, 1960s America for saying, you know what, it's, it's too much. I'll just stay over here. But I wonder if MLK ever heard the Spirit say to him, suffer it to be so now. I mean, it'll cost. And you got a choice. You don't have to. But if you are willing to step into this story in a different way, it will change the world. I've got many stories like this for my own life, one in particular is when, um, you know, when Rushing met me, I was in the closet, and I was happy um, in the United Methodist Church. No one needed to know. I was a church boy, and I was doing my thing, and everything was fine. And I'll just say it like this, friends, um, I, because of the church that I grew up in and, and sort of the world that I live in, um, I could have sworn I heard Jesus say to me, actually, Derek, I want you to come out. I want you to live honestly and truthfully in this world. Again, I grew up in a church where, you know, hearing Jesus wasn't a weird thing, so I'm good, y'all. Everything's cool. <laughs> but I did, can't act like I didn't hear it. I could have sworn I heard Jesus say, I want you to come out and live in truth. And, and because of the church that I grew up in, I, I you know, hearing that voice, um, I just told Jesus no. Because I was fine. I was, I was moving in leadership in the United Methodist Church in Florida, and a campus minister now over 20 years. No one needed to know this detail. It was just one mere detail. No one needed to know. But I got this sense that Jesus was saying, suffer it to be so now. Yes, it's going to cost. And I was busy, so I was like, is there really more? Oh my gosh, y'all, there was so much more. And two and a half years ago, I responded and I came out publicly and yeah, some people got upset because that's what we do. But I'll tell you what, I know that even though it has cost me, the reward of stepping into my truth, particularly in this moment in my tradition, has been everything. I think about this moment when Jesus is looking at John. Now I wonder if we can imagine him looking at each one of us. And we're, we're good for the most part, right? We're doing fine. We're here. We're in Plymouth Church. Did you really ask, do we really have to ask anything more of you? <laughs> but I wonder what it would be like if we could imagine Jesus looking at us. It's saying, suffer it to be so now. Step into this story. 
get off the sidelines and play a role that could very well change the world, or even better, change this community. In a few moments, we're going to celebrate our baptisms. For some of us, it's celebrating when we were baptized, and for others, it's going to be acknowledging that baptism is this beautiful thing. And as Rushing has told me, I'll be standing on this side. We'll be, there will be folks on both sides, I think, and he'll give better instructions. And I hope that when you come up and you know, I dip my hand into the water, I'll do the sign of the cross on your forehead. Um, I hope that you will first be reminded of just how deeply loved by God you are. I mean, if baptism is anything, it is a reminder of the immersion of grace that is covering every single one of us. If you look at the graphic on the, on the bulletin this morning, it's such a beautiful image of like Jesus being sort of enveloped with these waters. And I hope this morning that if you hear nothing else, you would be reminded that you are deeply loved by God and nothing could ever separate you from God's love. But I also want to invite you to consider that maybe the Spirit is looking at you, regardless of how old you are, regardless of where you've come from and what you have or haven't done, and could the Spirit be saying, maybe not in King James Version, but could the Spirit be saying to you, suffer it to be so now? Is there a role that you are being invited into a place you're in being invited to step in. Maybe it's an opportunity like Jesus to be identified with the least of these. I mean, this is what was said about him. This, this prophet, this Pharisee maybe even, this, this man um, walking in the world is always being identified with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and drunkards. Jesus was identified with the least of these, with the marginalized and the rejected, and maybe, just maybe, your role that you're being invited into is to be deeply identified with those whom the world continues to push to the side. Jesus had this ability to go up to religious leaders and people in power and to speak truth to them. And some of us in this space get to sit at tables and in rooms where somebody needs some words said to them. Yeah? Okay, two of you got me on that one. <laughs> and maybe the role that you're being invited into is to open your mouth and speak truth to those who've been given the opportunity to lead. Maybe, you know, one of the beautiful things we know about Jesus is that he always did what he needed to do to get as close to human brokenness as possible. Maybe that's the role for you. Friends, this morning, as we remember our baptism, we remember many things. But you are invited this morning to remember that we are a part of a much larger story. My favorite scripture in all of the New Testament is Romans 8, 19, and it says this. The whole world waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. My understanding of that scripture is that the whole world is waiting for you to step into the story. Weirdly enough, Des Moines is waiting for Plymouth Church to get off the sidelines and to maybe hear those words, suffer it to be so now, for thus it will fulfill all righteousness. Friends, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this space, these beautiful people. And I pray that you would pour your grace out on all of us as we continue to worship together. Thank you for the, your deep love for every single one of us. But I do pray, oh God, I pray that we might hear the invitation, the invitation to step into the story to play the roles that you have called us to play, to maybe even get off the sidelines. Yes, because people need to know that there's a God that loves them, and also that we might transform the world. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.
Friends, thanks for letting me share with you this morning.